Christ is risen. Welcome to our Easter Sunday morning celebration to those who come week by week, to those who come maybe less frequently, or for those for whom this may be the... Easter is about interruptions and chaos, and I'll just put my phone off. There we go. So, yeah. Chaos and the unexpected. But it's good to gather together. Some of us perhaps have already had opportunities to gather at other places, but we come here today, this morning, for our celebration. For those who are here in the church, we hope that you're able to stay behind afterwards with tea and coffee and Hope an opportunity just to develop our friendships. Grateful to those who provide um, such um, teas and coffees week by week. And to those who are watching online, we wish you too a, a blessed and happy Easter, whenever it is you are watching this service. We're celebrating all together today. There's no point at which our young people are going out but as our young people come in perhaps later on, um, just a reminder that over in the far corner here, there are various activity sheets that you should feel free to get up at any point and go and do, and either bring them back to where you're sitting or stay there. It's about being the church community together. Just before we stand and sing, just a reminder that there are things happening in the life of the church. That information is all on a, a paper copy of information at the door. It's also on our website, and it was also on the PowerPoint at the start. But just if I could highlight a few things. Um, the new prayer diary starts tomorrow. I'm grateful to Rona for putting that together. A number of us get that electronically. If you're someone who signed up for it and you haven't got it yet, maybe you could just let us know. But hopefully... Um, if you wanted it electronically, you've got it. However, if you like a paper copy, there are paper copies at the door for you to take away with you today. There's going to be continued restrictions on the pen with Parkinson bear with us. And during the week, um, open church is not going to be open tomorrow. It's Easter Monday. But Renew 23.3 at the Methodist Church will be open from 10 to, 10 to 12 tomorrow. So, if you're looking for something to do tomorrow, um, you'll be welcome at Renew 23. Um, then on Tuesday, uh, four C's, that's cake, coffee, craft, and chat. That meets at two o'clock in the new hall. There's no Wednesday Bible study this Wednesday, the third, but it meets next Wednesday. That is the 10th. On Thursday, there's the lunchtime service from 12.30 to 1.15, and then next Saturday being the first Saturday of a new month, there's the church prayer breakfast at quarter to nine to 10 o'clock in the new hall. All people are welcome. Uh, the walking group have organized their next series of walks that run from April to September. There's printed sheets in the vestibule with details of the walks as well as on our website. And just for your prayers, just a reminder that we are currently advertising for a, a new church secretary, a uh, closing date for applications is this coming week. If you are interested or know someone who might be and you'd like a bit more information, still time to speak to, to Robin or myself today. So I think that's all the information things. But in terms of church family news, I'm aware of two couple celebrating wedding anniversaries, Anne Martin, and also Dennis and Jackie Brown. So, uh, I think yours was yesterday, wasn't it? So, have a, I'm sure it was a good day. And um, in terms of birthdays, the only birthday I'm aware of is Ali Austin's, who is hiding upstairs behind the screen. So, happy birthday today, Ali. So, this is our Easter Sunday celebration where everything changes. So, just before we stand, you might want to join with me in these simple but powerful words 
you might want to respond in the yellow. The tomb was empty. The power of death was defeated. The future need not be feared. Yes, we declare, Jesus is alive. And so if you're able to, and if you wish to, you might want to stand as we sing together, Jesus Christ is risen today. In a moment, uh, James will come and lead us in prayer and then in the Lord's Prayer. But we're going to say together uh, a verse that is found in the first letter that Peter wrote. Uh, during the week on Thursday when we were doing our Bible study in Farsi, um, we had to look up a Bible verse. And it was this particular verse, uh, First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. This is our hope. So let's declare this together. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade.
let us join together in prayer and worship. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we praise you, we worship you, and we thank you this Easter morning that you sent your precious and only Son to die a painful and humiliating death on a cross in order to save us from the consequences of our sin. We praise you that you did this for every one of us in spite of the fact that we did not deserve such generosity and grace. Your deep love for us is expressed in the pain and torment that your son suffered for us. Today we particularly thank you that you're not a remote God who directs only from afar, but that you sent your son to rise again from the grave, risen to guide us through the ups and downs of life, risen to give us new birth, risen to give us a living hope, risen to drive away all our fears. As we celebrate your risen son, we need to pause, to say sorry and to ask forgiveness for not being the people that you wanted us to be, for going our own way and not following you, our shepherd, at all times. Having asked for your forgiveness, we are thankful and deeply grateful that we can be confident that you have forgiven us and that you have restored our relationship with you. Heavenly Father, today we want to understand the significance and the consequences of Jesus Christ as our risen Lord. He has conquered death he has set us free from the results that happen when we go our own way. He has given us a brand new life. He has given us an eternal hope, peace and joy that does not depend on us and our circumstances, but is based in you, Jesus. And that hope starts right now and never fades and goes with us into eternity. For all these amazing things that you have done for us and continue to do for us day by day, we raise our hearts to you in adoration, love and deep gratitude. You are an amazing and generous God. Jesus Christ, is risen today. Hallelujah. He is here with us this morning, and we ask that through his Holy Spirit, you would open our hearts to hear your voice, and that you'll bless Kenny and Stephen and all those who lead us in worship. He is risen. May we know his presence in our lives. Let us now say the Lord's Prayer together as it appears on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Morning and uh, happy Easter to you. Um, I'm going to show you some Easter customs from 
around the world. Um, and I wonder if you've had, ever had the privilege of celebrating Easter in a, in a country that's, that's not just Scotland. I think I've only done it once, and it was um, Chicago, um, at the side of Lake Michigan. And I'll never forget that experience. About 200 people gathered um, on a beach. Um, there was a brass band playing. We took communion um, and then had breakfast. It was a very sp special occasion. So it's, it's very clear that people around the, the world celebrate Easter in many um, different ways. And even, even our animal friends will celebrate Easter. That's um, a, an Easter parade in New York. And it's very good of them to come with their sun specks and their hats, isn't it? Yeah. Now, I wonder if you can guess where, where that is. Instead of um, you know, rolling chocolate eggs, um, people in this area in the world simply make a giant omelette. So where do you think that might be? This, this is in the form of a wee quiz just to, to test your knowledge. Or Can you think? The word omelette actually is a good clue. France, yeah. in, the, in the, south of, the south of France. Enough to feed an army, I suspect. And th this is um, many Latin American countries, Brazil and certain regions of Spain. They burn a, an effigy or, or an image of, if you like, one of the, the baddies of the Easter story. Can you guess who that is? Judas. So that's, um, that's how they cope with uh, the story of the Judas who betrayed Jesus. Um, and sometimes the effigy is mixed up with fireworks, so it's quite an explosive night, I understand. This is Poland now. This is Poland, and um, equivalent of tomorrow, Easter Monday, they call it Wet Monday. Wet Monday. Funnily enough, it always seems to be the women that um, get, get the soaking. Connection with Easter, water, wetness, baptism, yeah, you heard it. In fact, um, right at this, maybe not right at this minute, but within this, this hour, um, two um, baptismal services that I know of that are happening in Perth, in the Church of the Nazarene and Perth Baptist, um, used to be quite common, I understand, for baptisms to happen on Easter Sunday. That the idea that we are buried with Christ and we rise with Christ. Um, and just as we are a Marist just down the front here found out um, last Sunday, um, we, we are buried with Christ and we rise with Christ through baptism. If I say to you that this ceremony is called Tus Grisma, Tus Grisma, any linguists who can tell us which country Greece, yeah, Jim, Greece. And this is called the tapping or the cracking of the red egg custom. And Greeks will greet each other with the, with the refrain, just as we did this morning, Christos anesti. And the response will come back, Alethos anesti. Christos anesti. Christ has risen. Um, Alethos anesti. He has risen indeed. And what they'll do is they'll, um, it's, it's almost like a version of conquers. They'll tap each other's egg and say those greetings to each other, Christos Anesti, Alephos Anesti. And the winner is the one who can crack the opponent's egg without cracking their own egg. And if you want to see that happen in real life, come along to Tullach this afternoon <laughs> at two o'clock. We're going to try it out for real. Now, this, this option is from Bermuda, the flying of the kites. And on Good Friday, they make um, a, a, a six-sided kite, and they fly it on Easter Sunday. And I'm sure you can imagine, and you, or you can guess, um, the symbolism involved in that, Christ being raised from the dead on Easter Sunday. Now, I wonder if, I wonder if you've been at, at this place can you tell where that is? It's called the Duomo. Florence, yes. Florence, the Duomo, the, um, the cathedral in Florence. And they have what's called the explosion of the cart. The explosion of the cart. So the high point of the, the, 
the, the Easter service just outside the Duomo, thankfully. Um, they, they bring this great big bonfire and they set off fireworks um, just to create the happiness, the explosive happiness of Christ being risen. And just lastly, I wonder if you can guess where that is. If, if I tell you that what, what's happening there is that people are throwing their old pots out their house onto the street below, um, symbolizing getting rid of the old and the coming in of the new. Can you guess where that might be? Who, who, which, which, um, which country is good at cracking plates, smashing plates? Aye, please, there it is. It's Corfu, the, the island of Corfu. So they threw out all their old possessions, all their old life, making way for the new. Right, I think you managed to guess all of these, so well done. A big clap for everybody involved. Huh? Okay. Years ago, um, we, when we, my parents stayed in Loch Open, there was a couple, a mum and a son came through from Mr. Hales to stay with us for the week. And uh, it's kind of strange now because the guy Mark's in his 40s, but he was only about nine and he went flying down the street and he came running back and he said, Mum, I found the Explosive Church. And we kind of walked down and it was the Episcopal Church. And if only we were explosive. But maybe that's our Pentecost. But today is about the explosion of life from the tomb. Michael's going to read for us from Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 28, the first 10 verses. We hear again of the events in that chaotic place of the garden. Matthew 28, verses 1 to 10, page 1,000 in the Pew Bibles. Jesus has risen. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Thanks, Michael. We're going to sing again. So the musicians want to come up. We're going to sing the more kind of modern Eastern hymn. See what a morning, glorious and bright. So you might want to be standing if you are going to stand and sing, ready to join in.
It's Easter Sunday, and the long wait of Lent is over. And today we come celebrating the truth that Jesus was raised from the dead. He lives. For Lent, we had been thinking about how different people might think about the future. If you were with us, you know that we looked at six possible ways, six ways that we probably ourselves at different points have thought about the life. And four of them, I'm aware, were quite negative. There was like denying that change was coming. There was fear of change. There was, let's resist it. And it's really only in the last two Sundays we began to be a bit more positive. And Stephen reminded us that Jesus said, when I go away, the Holy Spirit will come and there'll be somebody with you. Remember that image? He'll be in your corner. And then last week, we thought about trusting God for whatever comes. But now with the events of the empty tomb, there's more to say about how we can face the future. And we'll maybe draw out two brief things. But before we do that, we're just going to remind ourselves of the past week, of Holy Week, as we watch together a retelling. The Easter story begins on Palm Sunday. Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey. The crowd shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They waved their palm branches and laid their cloaks on the ground. A few days later, Jesus and his disciples were sharing the Passover meal. Jesus predicted that one of them would betray him and his disciples were shocked and saddened. Jesus broke the bread and said, this is my body, broken for you. And then he took the wine and said, this is my blood of the covenant, poured out for many. Jesus said to Peter, before the cock crows this very night, you will disown me three times. But Peter insisted, I am willing to die with you, Jesus. I will never disown you. Jesus and his disciples went out to the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus asked his disciples to keep watch while he prayed. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. If it is possible, may this cup be taken away from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then Judas came to betray Jesus to the religious leaders. Jesus was arrested and the disciples ran away. The religious leaders put Jesus on trial before the high priest. Even though Jesus was innocent, he didn't defend himself from the false accusations made against him. When the high priest asked Jesus, are you the Messiah? Jesus answered, I am. Then they all condemned Jesus to be deserving of death and they beat him. While Jesus was on trial, Peter was in the courtyard below. Three times Peter was asked if he knew Jesus, but three times Peter denied knowing him. The cock crowed and Peter remembered what Jesus had said and he wept. Jesus was then taken to Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent, but the crowd shouted, crucify him and Pilate was afraid. So Pilate let Barabbas, a murderer, go free instead of Jesus. They dressed Jesus with a purple robe and a crown of thorns. Jesus was crucified on Good Friday with a thief either side of him. At midday, darkness came over the whole land for three hours. Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he breathed his last. When the Roman centurion saw how Jesus died, he said, 
Surely this man was a son of God. After Jesus died, his body was placed in a tomb. And a heavy stone was rolled across the entrance. Early on the morning of the third day, the women came to anoint Jesus' body. But when they got there, the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty. An angel told them the good news. Jesus is not here. He has risen from the dead. He's not here. He's risen. I wonder what that might mean for us. I wonder what you think about the future. As Stephen said, uh, there's an event happening at Tullach at two, and I hope if you're free, you might want to come and join us at the park at Matheson Drive. We've been um, checking our apps Gavin had about how many plans, I don't know, and the possibility of snow, rain, but it looks like it's going to be dry. So at two o'clock, we'll gather there. But many of us do that, don't we? We want to plan ahead, and we assume that we can predict what the weather will be like. We like to know what's coming, what's the future going to be. Yesterday, I was in Glasgow and coming back, and um, Maybe you've got a built-in sat-nav in your car. I've got my Google, my phone, my maps on my phone. And not only does it tell me where to go, but it can also highlight in red if the traffic is going to be slow. And I might want to try and find an alternative route because you like to plan ahead. We're, we're all now so used to wanting to know what's coming that we can predict. wonder what the future holds for us. I'm told, and I've not dared done it yet, but if you take a picture of yourself and put it into a certain app, it might tell you what you look like in the future. And some of you think, why? Maybe some of you just look in the mirror, and you wonder, what am I going to look like? What's the future going to be? Matthew tells us of two women who come to the tomb where Jesus has been placed. They're absolutely devastated because they had seen Jesus die. And now, what would the future be without him? One of the women, Mary Magdalene, had become a follower of Jesus, but now what was she to do? The future seemed bleak. Maybe you had a job, and it's come to an end very suddenly. We hear these horrific stories of people being called in and the job is finished, the company's gone bust, and you're now thinking, well, what am I going to do? It's not just the loss of money. The anger, the sense of being let down, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Or maybe you have a hobby, it's a bowling, or you're in a golf club and circumstances change and it's stopped, it's closed down, and again, what are you going to do? How are you going to fill your life? And these women are having to cope with all these emotions of anger and frustration. What are we going to do? Jesus is dead. And then Matthew tells us that there was an earthquake and a spectacular appearance of an angel, which causes, of course, great fear to the women. It's understandable, but very quickly the angel speaks words of reassurance. Do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he's not here. He's risen. He is alive. And the women are then invited to go and have a look inside the tomb, for they need to be reassured that this is not a wind-up. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. And the women look, and then they're told, go and tell the disciples the incredible news, Jesus is alive. The future is going to be different. And these women get a new purpose. 
They're first of all to pass on the good news. Women were not viewed as reliable witnesses. And so for them to be given this honor, this privilege, is radical. It's revolutionary. But I wonder if you know some of the Bible story that you're maybe hearing echoes of something else. Not at the end of Jesus' life, but at the beginning. Because in a book in the Bible called Luke, he tells us that when Jesus was born, angels appeared and with the same word spoken to the women, do not be afraid. And they are told to go and see the baby. And we were saying not that long ago, imagine the shepherds being given that privilege, those who were treated as almost the outcasts. They get the privilege because in God's kingdom, there is a complete turnaround. Those who are often thought of not having anything are blessed. And the gospel writers from the birth of Jesus to the end of Jesus saying, in this new kingdom, no one is overlooked. The shepherds had a part to play, and now Mary and the women have a privileged purpose. Jesus is alive. And the first thing that says to me is that we can have a purpose. God is in control and because he is working his purposes out, which we may not always understand, but we are called to be part of that kingdom where because Jesus is alive, life can be changed. Attitudes can be transformed from a place of feeling worthless and abandoned and ignored and overlooked and useless. The message comes, no, Jesus is alive. He died for you. You're drawn into that. And it strikes me that when you hear and sit with people who often f most fear the future, it's often from a sense of hopelessness. What's the point? What can I do? But Jesus has come back to life. Not only that we can experience new life with God, praise God, that is real, but to be drawn into a kingdom that's changing the world. Everything's been made new. And we're invited to be part of that. I rarely have these moments, so when they happen, I have to hold on to them as a gift. But during the week, it was as if God said to me, and this was on Thursday, do you see what I'm doing? And it came at a moment of real frustration, I have to be honest, with meetings and just hearing of gloom and gloom and doom. And then God just brought to mind certain faces of people in whom he is clearly doing something. And I just get to be the privilege of seeing that. People who are being influenced by the gospel. God is at work, and we are called to be part of that. And maybe we need that encouragement today. We all have a purpose we have a part to play. And we'll think of the second thing in, in, a, in a moment, but I want to pause there and invite. Um, I don't know if it was getting a bit of stick from the musicians, but they were saying, we sing this song a lot. And I don't make any apologies because I think we need to be reminded that we are people of the risen King called One Faith, and one Lord. So again, if you're comfortable and you want to, would you stand with me as we sing, Come, people of the risen King.
I wonder if you've um, ever been told or <clears throat> find yourself in a place that leaves you feeling slightly anxious. Maybe when you were at school, you were told to go to the headmaster's office, and you did not know why. And you're sitting outside. Were you in trouble? Or did she have a reward for you? You're there waiting, wondering. Maybe you're someone whose job involves having to deliver, maybe a postie or a, a van driver, and you get an address. And it's, to be honest, it's one of those addresses that it's an area that you've never been to before, but it's got a dodgy reputation. And so you're going with a degree of intrepidation. Maybe you've volunteered to give someone a lift to church, and then you get a phone call, and it's him you have to pick up. And you're just not sure, because, well, people say you can be a bit grumpy. And maybe you don't want someone grumpy in your car, but you promised, so you're going to do it. Or maybe you're someone like myself who could only be described as a picky eater. When we were in Kenya, I dreaded, I really honestly dreaded that tension between recognizing the hospitality and the generosity of people who invited us into their homes and knowing that I might struggle to eat. I just don't have that whatever it is. Anne can eat anything. And afterwards, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you that that was hard going. I'm sorry, I just can't. I am picky. And often, way out my comfort zone is not a place I like. Yesterday, we were in Glasgow, and I had my first ever Greek mood, uh, food. And I'm back, and <laughs> I'll go again. But often, by nature, if you are nervous or tentative, when you're told to go to somewhere new, do something new, then you can be a bit hesitant. Jesus is alive. And the women, remember the angel came to them and told them that. They have to go and tell the disciples. They were to say, He is risen from the dead, and He is going ahead of you into Galilee. And so the women set off, and Matthew tells us in that kind of strange phrase, they were afraid but filled with joy. Just such a human emotion. Afraid, this is, wow, where, what's going on? But it sounds exciting. Afraid yet filled with joy. Trying to get their heads around it. Did they talk to one another to try and make sense of it? Or were they stunned into silence, hitched up their cloaks and were running or jogging as fast as they could? But whatever they were doing, they're suddenly stopped in their tracks because from nowhere it would appear, Jesus greets them. He is alive. And they fall down at his feet and they begin to worship him. And Jesus repeats the words of the angels, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. We just kind of bypass, don't we? My brothers, the very, very people who had abandoned him, who had rejected him, who had stayed silent, my brothers. Tell them I'm going to Galilee. It's like a shepherd image. I'm going ahead of them to Galilee. Now, back in chapter 4 of Matthew's gospel, there's a couple of verses where Galilee is described. That's quite small print, but it's described almost as the place of darkness, the place that you would perhaps want to avoid. But Jesus in His ministry, the light, has a special ministry in Galilee. And in this end of the gospel, He says to the women, tell the men, I'm going ahead of them to Galilee. Now, He'll meet them in Jerusalem. 
but he will also go ahead to them into Galilee. How are we to face the future? Well, we've got a purpose to find out what it is that God wants us to do at this stage of our lives. But there's also this final thing. There's an excitement for those followers that Jesus was going to head into Galilee. They could face a con with confidence that wherever they go in obedience, Jesus was already there. And I think Matthew is trying to tell those of us who would read this story long after it had actually happened that the living Jesus goes ahead of His people. And so therefore, we should never be afraid of what lies ahead. We can't predict it, and it might be very different from what we've been used to, but God is still working His purposes out. We have a purpose, and we can have a confidence and what does that mean for us as a church and as individuals? Maybe we need to change the way we think to try and make space to say, where is God already at work? And can we join in? Because very often our thinking is, what do we need to start that God can then come along and bless? Maybe God's ahead of us doing new things. And He invites us to come and join in it and find our purpose there. Does that not change the way we might think about this coming week or the coming weeks? God is already ahead of us doing new things. I was listening to Anne's podcast about Bertha Park called Emerging Amazing. We'll try and put it onto our website. It's on my Facebook page. I find it really exciting listening to what she said as she knocked on doors. People were kind of already waiting, not for the church, that wasn't the language, but excited about something and could they get involved. It was as if God was already there and we're now being invited into it to discover more. Instead of opposition, there was actually an openness and maybe as the church faces challenges, maybe not everybody's against us. Maybe there's people waiting, people with things to help us with. A purpose and a confidence. He is alive and He goes before you into the Galilees, the dark places, the places of new opportunities, the places perhaps we've written off. He is there at work. Where is God at work? Let's join in His mission. So we have a purpose, and we have a God who's gone before us. We don't have to have fear. He knows everything. He knows our fears, and we can tell Him those, and He has gone before us. This Easter, let's renew our hope in the one who is alive. The future will be different but we can live it positively with purpose and with confidence. And as we're at that time of the year where there's flowers coming and we see new life emerging from the ground, that image of life emerging is captured in the well-known Easter hymn, Now the Green Blade Riseth.
hope that as you come into church today, someone offered you a stone. Uh, I hope you don't think we're cheap skates rather than offering you a chocolate egg. But I hope that the um, next few minutes will explain why a stone. And if you did pick up a stone, you maybe just want to, to feel um, around the stone and have a look at it. Um, the time, for, time of Lent is a time of self-examination and self-reflection, and the people that we are that made it necessary um, for Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And in a sense, looking at a stone, I think, can be helpful as we look back um, at our lives, no matter what age we are. Maybe from a distance, the stones look shiny and smooth and perfect. But if you look more closely at your stone, you'll see holes, wee holes, wee perforations. You'll see cracks. You'll see sharp bits. You'll see contrasts. And I think for me that the contrasts and the, and the stones remind us that there are some bits of our life which have been absolutely beautiful and absolutely great. But there are some bits of our lives we've made a real mess of, perhaps situations or relationships. And I'm thinking of the small holes or, or perforations, the times that perhaps our, our service to others and our relationship to others have often been pitted and rutted, just like that stone. There's also cracks and crevices in, in this stone that stand for the, the saddest moments in our life. Perhaps we've lost someone very, very dear to us. But we're reminded that Easter is God's timing for reminding us that He moves stones. And there's nothing so awful or terrible that he cannot deal with, that there's no kind of failure or trouble or even death that can separate us from his love, his peace, his presence, and his forgiveness. It may be that you may want to keep this stone and, and take it away with you and to think just a wee bit more about that, just a tangible reminder of what Easter might mean for us. Or you may find it helpful um, for, there's, there's a few folk around the, the, the church who have a, an offering plate, to place the stone in that plate and the plate will be brought forward just to the communion table um, as we say our prayers of intercession. So whatever decision you come to, hold on to the stone even as the prayer's going on, or if you want to put it in a plate, and it'll be brought forward to the communion table. Um, you make the decision. Both decisions are equally valid. So I can ask the people who have the offering plates just to go around and, and, and offer that opportunity to people if they want to, me to bring the, the stones forward um, as we come to a prayer of intercession.
And let's bring to God our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let's pray. Loving God, this is a season of new beginnings. Not just your glorious resurrection from the dead, but the resurrection from broken dreams, crushed hopes, and shattered faith. And we praise you for it. You have promised that we can all be born again, that anyone who believes in you will become a new creation, renewed, remade, and refreshed through your grace. Hear us as we pray for all who are living lives that seem furthest away from knowing the joy of your resurrection today. Those we know in our families and among our friends who are in constant pain. Those who are ill, either at home or in hospital. And those worried about the future. We remember all who know the difficulties of bringing up families with scarce resources. We remember all who have known the pain of change through advancing years or separation through death. Gracious God, where there is sorrow and worry, grant your joy and your peace. And where important decisions need to be made to improve lives for all people, grant our leaders and decision makers the wisdom that comes from you alone. We pray for countries racked by inner divisions and others threatened by the evil of war from their neighbors. We pray for the victims of war, for the injured, the orphans, the homeless, and those whose mental health will never be the same. Gracious God, where hatred rules, may your love emerge victorious, and may your power silence and remove all who seek to overturn the purposes of your kingdom on earth, just as you did on that first Easter day. Heavenly Father, as we think about our lives represented by these stones, and as we have remembered the lives and circumstances of those we know, and those that we are simply conscious of across the world, remind us again that endings can lead to new beginnings, and that from the old, new life can spring. And so may that resurrection confidence touch our lives and bring purpose and hope to our troubled world. Receive our thanks for all that has been and open our hearts to all that shall be. For we ask all these things in the name of Jesus, our crucified, risen, and ascended Savior. Amen. And now we sing that hymn without which no Easter Sunday would be complete. Thine be the glory.
Because he lives, we will not be afraid. Because he has gone before us, we will be hopeful. Because he has conquered death, we will live life to the full. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.